to set up 2 Kings chapter 22. And in chapter 21, we had two extremely evil kings. We had King Manasseh and we had King uh, Amon or Ammon. And these two kings were very evil. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh rebuilt altars for Baal. He made wooden images. He built pagan altars in the temple. He built pagan altars in the courtyard of the temple. He practiced witchcraft and soothsaying, just an evil king. He also killed, it says, a whole lot of innocent people. Ammon, at 22 years old, it says, followed in uh, the footsteps of his father Manasseh, doing evil in the sight of the Lord. He served the idols and worshiped the false gods. It says that he forsook the Lord. He forsook the Lord. And that's really what it all comes down to, right? Forsaking the Lord. Manasseh and Ammon, it says, forsook the Lord. It's where sin stems from, doesn't it? When we forsake the Lord, when we walk away from God, when we abandon God, when there's no longer that moral standard in our lives, there's no longer uh, any rules, right? We just do whatever we feel is right in our own eyes. We're the new standard. We think that, you know, we make the rules and, and, uh, and, and set the standard. We decide what is right and wrong. And that's what was going on with Manasseh and Ammon. Uh, but there's hope. There's always hope, and we find hope here in chapter 22 with King Josiah. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, his daughter, uh, the daughter of Adia and uh, of Bozketh, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in all the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. So we have Josiah here, a young boy, eight years old as he uh, takes over the kingdom in Judah, the grandson of this evil King Manasseh. And uh, Josiah decided to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. It says that he didn't turn to the left side and he didn't turn to the right. He kept his eyes on Jesus. He kept his eyes on the Lord. And this young man, Josiah, has a desire in chapter 22 to repair the temple there in Israel. Uh, The temple was somewhat destroyed by the previous kings, right? These evil kings that uh, just made a mockery of the Lord and built up these false idols in it. They also allowed allowed it to be somewhat um, destroyed or desecrated. So Uh, Josiah here decides, you know what, I'm going to rebuild this temple if I want to follow the Lord truly as my fathers uh, did. So he sends a scribe to the house of the Lord to count the money that had come in for repairs. And as they're doing the work in the temple, Hilkiah, the high priest, finds the book of the law, right? You guys might remember the story, the book of the law. And as um, as they find the book of the law, it had been lost for at least the time of Manasseh and Ammon, if not longer. So it had not been read for a very long time, the word of the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 11 through 13, let's go ahead and read it. It says, Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, the son of uh, the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and uh, Asiah's servant the, of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because of our fathers, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. How powerful the word of God is, right? How powerful it is that when a a young boy, well, a young man now being 26 years old by the time he uh, discovers this book of the law, that he can read it and he can say, wow, this is what we're doing wrong. This is what we've been missing. This This is the reason why we're in the position that we are in today. This is why our land is the way that it is and our people are living the way that they are are living. 
You know, when men suppress the word of God, they desire to suppress the power of God. They want God gone. They want nothing to do with God. They don't, it's not just that they don't want the word of God. They don't want the authority of God. They don't want the power of God to be in their lives or anyone else's. They want God gone. And they fear the day that the word of the Lord will return. Because when the, when the word of the Lord returns, it will clean house, right? It will change lives. And this is exactly what it does with Josiah and, in, uh, and the day and age that he was living with the children of Israel. That authority comes back to the Lord John 1.1, 1, 1, you guys know it, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. The Word, we have nothing without it. Everything that was made was made with the Word, Jesus Christ. These previous kings knew to get rid of the authority of God, to get rid of the power of God, We have to get rid of the word of God. And that's exactly what they did with the book of the law. The power of God starts to diminish there in the land of Israel. Judah is growing weaker and Babylon is growing stronger. And when the word of God is suppressed in our own lives, we see that the authority and the power of God also uh, become suppressed as well. When we're not reading, when we're not studying the word of God, we see the authority of God starts to diminish. We start to lose that peace, that joy, right, that we talk so much about on Wednesday or Sunday, that joy that we just sang about so much with our worship songs. As, we, as the word of God is suppressed, we start to lose that power of God. Josiah was eight years old when he started to reign. He was 26 when he found the book of the law. Jeremiah says in his book that uh, he began to prophesy in the 13th year of, uh, of King Josiah. So Josiah was 21 years old. He was, it was five years before Josiah found the book of the law that uh, Jeremiah was called to ministry, that the Lord called him. And not only did uh, Jeremiah here in chapter 22 have to repair the temple, but he also had to reestablish a proper priesthood for the temple. He also had to reestablish the correct temple ordinances, right? He had to go in and and just clean house with the people. He had to destroy the idolatry that was in the land. He had to get the people to participate along with what was going on and what the Lord had put on his heart. And this wasn't as simple as we may think. It's not uh, as easy as, as we say, you know, as it can be said, you know, to break a nation from idolatry that has been following these false gods for so long. You know, people get kind of interesting about their little idols. You know, they're little, you know, they get real personable about them. You know, to take away someone's idol is like trying to take away one of their children. Most people would rather give up a child, you know, than give up an idol. You know, they get real possessive of it. And this is what Josiah was going through, trying to not just repair the temple, but he was also trying to, to restore the land of Israel there in this time. And though he could physically stop the worship of these false idols, though he could physically just tear all of them down and, and burn all the, all the idols and wooden images that had been set up in the land, you know, it was impossible for him to force the people to truly desire and to truly worship the Lord in their hearts. Completely impossible for Josiah to force a relationship with the Lord, with the children of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 11, we read, it says, The Lord said also to me, in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry 
that she defiled the land and committed idolatry uh, with stones and trees. Sounds pretty dumb when you put it like that, right? With stones and trees, they committed adultery. I'm sorry, adultery. And verse 10 says, and yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, pretense meaning in make-believe and acting, that hypocritical heart. Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Wow. This land of Israel that the Lord already had completely wiped out, he's saying was more holy than this treacherous land of Judah. This land that uh, treacherous means betrayal or deception, this deceptive land there, Judah, even more, or, or, uh, even more deceptive, even more wicked than the land of Israel there. Even in this time of revival, the children of Israel there in Judah were still running from the Lord. Their hearts were f- still far from the Lord. Second Kings uh, 22, verse 16 through 20. Let's go ahead and read it. This is uh, what the prophetess has to say as Josiah brings the book of the law to her. Verses 16 says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book uh, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. With, uh, therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be uh, gathered to your to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king, to King Josiah. So the Lord says, through this prophetess that Josiah's heart is completely right before the Lord as he humbles himself, you know, uh, through the judge, though the judgment that is to come on Judah is still eminent, though it still has to happen, uh, Josiah, it says, will be spared. And I'm sure many others as well, whose hearts were right before the Lord in that time. Chapter 23 is about Josiah restoring the land Uh, to the way that the Lord desired it to be. He gathers the people, he reads from the book of the law, he makes a covenant uh, with the people to follow the Lord. Uh, He brought out all the articles of the false gods. He he burned all of the uh, all of the wooden images he uh, that his that his grandfather Manasseh had set up in the land. He removed horses and burned chariots that uh, uh, that was used to worship the sun god. And he even went and tore down a bunch of shrines that were in the land of Samaria that the children of Israel had set up in prior years. And you can read about all of that there in chapter 23. Uh, Verses 26 through 27 tells us that the Lord did not turn from his wrath and that Judah would still have to be removed from his sight, he says. And I could just hear Josiah, you know. But Lord... I did what was right before you. I tore my clothes. I wept. I repented. I fixed, you know, the temple. I repaired the temple. I I brought the people back, you know, into communion with you. I could see all the people just watching the transformation before their eyes of, of the land, what was going on, and just thinking, ah, those crazy prophets. I knew that, you know, they had, whatever they said wasn't going to come to pass. That crazy Jeremiah, they're prophesying in the land. There won't be any judgment. There won't be any destruction. The Lord was patiently just waiting. Patiently just waiting for them to repent. Isn't that just like the Lord? 
You know, just patiently waiting for us to come back always. Waiting as long as he possibly can uh, before judgment. That wrathful God that the world sees as, as wrathful, as jealous. He just simply waits, really desiring for every chance of repentance really desiring just for every possibility of repentance he just waits it's so awesome how he does that for josiah and for those in the land of judah as king josiah humbles himself before god he sees the wickedness of his fathers he wept he tore his clothes he was remorseful he repented god just patiently waits yet he would completely never sees from the punishment that he has to eventually carry out on sin. You know, though he may delay for the opportunity of restoration and forgiveness, eventually judgment has to happen. You know, eventually uh, that judgment must take place. And that judgment for the believer, praise the Lord, is way different, is extremely different than that judgment for the non believer that judgment is really a time of celebration for the judgment that has already been fulfilled through Christ for those that have accepted the Lord verses 28 and 30 let's read in chapter 23 verse 28 says now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did are they not written in the books uh, of the chronicle of the chronicles of the kings of Judah in this day in his days Pharaoh Necho king of Egypt went to the aid of the king uh, of Assyria to the river Euphrates and King Josiah went against him and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he was confront when he confronted him then his servants moved his body in a chariot from Megiddo brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb and the people of the land took Jehoahaz the son of Josiah anointed him and made him king in his father's place it was a sad day when Josiah died i'm sure right second chronicles tells us that all of Jerusalem mourned for Josiah's death. He, Second Chronicles even mentions Jeremiah, that even Jeremiah mourned the day that uh, Josiah died. And uh, um, I'm sure Jeremiah was even probably looking at this day thinking, wow, that last hope, this godly king, you know, maybe even thinking that, that the Lord wouldn't even carry out his judgment on the land of Judah because of this godly king, Josiah. And as Jeremiah watches King Josiah's body being brought back into the land, you know, just mourning uh, for that, probably thinking, wow, here it is, you know, that, uh, that Babylon, uh, the invasion of Babylon is now becoming closer and closer. As Josiah dies, we get a look at the remaining four kings of Judah. We see Jehoahaz, uh, which it says was set up uh, as king in his place here. We have Jehoiakim. We also have Jehoiakim. And then we have the last king of Judah who is Zedekiah. In verse 31 through 34, uh, there in chapter 23, we see the reign of Jehoahaz. And Jehoahaz uh, had a pretty short reign. He reigned for only three months. And within that three months, uh, he turned back and did evil in the sight of the Lord again. He went back to the ways of Manasseh and Ammon and all that Josiah had established, all that Josiah had done uh, had, would, ha would have been lost and it would never be again in the land of Israel or Judah. Pharaoh Necho from Egypt puts Jehoahaz in prison eventually and he takes uh, him from prison to Egypt where Jehoahaz will eventually pass away, die there in Egypt. Pharaoh Necho, Necho sets up Eliakim, his brother, as king, and he sets up a tax on the people uh, there in Judah. He changes Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Uh, so before Babylon conquers Judah, before Babylon invades Judah, as we read about throughout the book of Jeremiah, we see this power struggle with Egypt as they also try to control 
uh, as they also try to control Judah there. Uh, eventually, as we get to Jeremiah chapter 46, we'll see Jeremiah speaking about the judgment that will come upon Egypt even for, this, uh, for the acts that they had against Israel. So really neat just to see where Jeremiah is going in all of this. Jeremiah 46, 15 through 17 says, Why are you... Why are your valiant men swept away? Speaking about Egypt here. They did not stand because the Lord drove them away. He made many fall. Yes, one fell upon another. And they, speaking of the Israelites, said, Arise, let us go back to our own people and to the land of our nativity. From the oppressing sword, they cried there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He has passed by the appointed time. And verse 19 says, O you daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself to go into captivity. I love that. Pharaoh Nico is but a noise. But a noise. Nothing physical, nothing tangible, nothing that can touch you or hurt you. He's but a noise passing away in his appointed time. But it says, it says daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself for uh, for that captivity, the Lord is warning them, though you are out of Egypt, be ready uh, for here comes Babylon. Verses 35 through 37, let's read there in chapter 23. It says, so Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his assessment, to give to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebudah, the daughter of Pediah of, R- of Rumah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Ah, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. Man, everything was set up for you. Josiah had set you up for success. And yet how easily you are swayed to go back to doing evil in the sight of the Lord. All you had to do was stay the course. All you had to do is continue on in what your father had set up for you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we have been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, it isn't that hard for sin to ensnare us, is it? It's pretty easy for sin to trap us. We had to uh, we had to leave last week one day, and and we had to be gone all day from our house. So we decided, you know, uh, Shiloh, our nine month old golden retriever puppy, she's been pretty good when we leave her outside, right? She's been she's been good out there and uh, and with the backyard and on her own, and and you know we're always there with her. We always watching her out there, and so we decide, you know what? Let's go ahead and leave her outside while we leave for the day. You know, we just reward her. She gets to play outside and stuff. And, you know, we're reseeding the grass out there. So we kind of have it all blocked off. We have the, uh, you know, so she can't dig it up any more than she already has. We have the sprinklers blocked off so she can't chew through those again because my brother just came over and replaced all the valves and everything. So we thought, you know, she'll be pretty good back there. So we leave her there and and, uh, she ends up finding this little tiny hole space that is in our brick wall and it's literally maybe like four or five inches wide and she climbs through this brick wall that is behind an orange tree uh, that we normally have blocked off and she climbs up onto the hill in our backyard and she is just having a blast there on the hill in the backyard. You know, I could just see her prancing around back there, just back and forth on the hill. You know, king of the hill, this is my hill right here. This is my backyard. She's tearing up through the weeds. She's pulling out all the flowers up there. She's rolling around, digging holes. She's just like having a field day, you know. She is just loving it. And as she's up on that hill in the backyard as she's rolling around digging holes she ends up rolling around 
in all of these foxtails, right? So we get home and there's Shiloh and she is covered, covered in foxtails. And I'm thinking, man, I got to take her to the groomer or even to the vet or something. I mean, some of them are so close to her skin that they're just embedded in her. I end up waiting two hours or spending two hours combing and brushing all of these foxtails out of her long golden retriever hair. Some of them, a lot of them, I end up having to just completely cut out, right? Because they're just so embedded and and entangled there in her hair. You know, and that's how sin is, isn't it? We have our fun, we roll around, we mess around in it. And yet we get trapped. It so easily ensnares us and just traps us. And yet it becomes so obvious that we're trapped in sin, right? She was trying to act like nothing had happened when we got home. I wasn't up on the hill. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I'm just sitting here. And they're all over her, you know? And she's just, ah, tongues hanging out, tails, you know, flapping all over. She's jumping all over us. And fox tails all over her. Like nothing had ever happened. She was ensnared in her sin. She was caught in it, you know? But it's interesting, though, that it's our presence that when we're home, that keeps her from sin, right? When we're home, just having a witness there keeps her off that hill, keeps her out of that grass, keeps her on the straight and narrow, you know, that accountability that she has. Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim had lost that accountability. They lost that great witness uh, that it spoke about there in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. They had lost that witness that surrounded them. And what, is, what did it, uh, 12 once? It says, therefore, since you are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we're surrounded by that accountability. And because of that, we should lay aside that sin that easily ensnares us. Because of the accountability that we have with one another, let us cast off that sin. Let us flee that youthful lust that Paul encouraged. Let us flee that immature lust, that immature sin. Chapter 24 in 2 Kings is the beginning of the end. There in verses one through seven, we see Jehoiakim uh, ends up as a servant to the king of Babylon. It says that he was used as a vassal to the king of Babylon, that he was, um, uh, that he was a person in, so, in a subordinate position uh, for taxation or gain, a vassal. He ends up rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and, and, uh, and, and through that rebellion, the Lord leads the Chaldeans, the Syrians, the Moabites, and Ammon to attack uh, Judah there. And again, as we get to Jeremiah chapter 47, chapter 48, and chapter 49, uh, we will see what the Lord will do to these nations because of their actions against the children of uh, Israel there along with the land of Egypt. Jeremiah mentions Jehoiakim 23 times in his book. 23 times, all being, uh, or most of them being after, the cha- after chapter 22. So as we start getting to the end of Jeremiah there, you'll start to hear uh, the name Jehoiakim. And, and in chapter 22, Jeremiah writes a letter to the sons of Josiah. And this is what he says in Jeremiah 22, 18 and 19. He says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, alas, alas is like groaning for someone. Alas, my brother, or alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, alas, my master, or alas, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Wow, the people will not even mourn for Jehoiakim. They're so fed up with the position that he put them in, right? The taxation, the, uh, uh, the position that he, that he put them in with Egypt and with Pharaoh. Uh, just everything that was going on in the nation. It says that he will be buried with the barrel of a donkey. Wow. Verses 8 through 12 
after Jehoiakim dies, his son Jehoiakim takes the throne. And again, we see a very short reign. Jehoiakim only uh, reigns for three months. And again, he does evil in the sight of the Lord going back to the gods of his uh, fathers, Manasseh and Ammon. And uh, Judah has been attacked 